So I'd leave the room and they'd be like, why are you leaving the room? You just should be able to undress right in here in front of me. Like, why are you so uncomfortable in your skin that you can't undress in front of me right now, right here? You're too shy, forget it. You're not right for this job. Then I got also encountered experiences where I was told that I like photographed funny and that I should get a nose job and think about other cosmetic surgeries. And that was at 16? Yeah, I was at 16. Welcome to Not Alone. Today I have the lovely Paige Adams Gallery with me. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. Of course, we are in this beautiful home of yours. This is such an amazing setting and it already calms me. You know, I'm getting into my uh, groove with this conversation. Mm -hmm. But just to give a little bit of background, you are the co-founder and creative director of Page. You started the company in 2005. Yes. Right? Well, actually, the first day of Page was July 1st, 2004. Okay. But the first delivery into retail stores was in 2005. Amazing. And it Mm -hmm. felt, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if it felt for you like a quick progress. But to me, I mean, Paige kind of became such a huge sought after denim brand. And it's everywhere. And I'm sure most people have at least a pair or two in their closet. Mm -hmm. But something else that I really loved learning about you is your passion to inspire and empower people. Thank you. You are a board member for the Rape Foundation and the Women of Tomorrow. Yes. And supporter of so many other amazing initiatives. So in order to understand and learn about your present, I would love to go back to the beginning. Mm. You grew up in a very interesting environment. You grew up in Alaska. Yes. I would love to hear about that. (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy. My father was raised in Alaska. Later on in life, he met my mom in Utah when he went to university. And When I was about six, he moved us back up to Alaska. So I lived in Alaska from the age of six until 16. They were my formative years. I went from Southern California actually to Alaska at the age of six. It's amazing because I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have lived in such a beautiful place Mm -hmm. that was very low key, felt very safe. It like felt like one of those places you can just go out and play. You can enjoy the different seasons. In hindsight, yeah, I learned a lot over time that it's not quite what I thought it was growing up. How so? Well, I mean, if I really want to get to the point of like feeling safe or not safe, Mm -hmm. when I was actually 16, that's when I was raped in Alaska. And mm. so that felt obviously not safe. But like growing up in Alaska, I always felt like I could go anywhere I wanted to go, do anything I wanted to do, leave my purse sitting out at school, leave our house unlocked, leave the car unlocked. And it just felt like this imag- amazing, like magical place that was just full of nature and super safe. Mm-hmm. But if I go back to like thinking about what was amazing about Alaska instead of the hard part about Alaska was that it gave me a really strong foundation of grounding of what I think is something that's so important in my life today. Like I love to get out in nature and hike. I love like living in this kind of environment and being in this space where I feel very tranquil. There's nothing better than going into the mountains and Mm -hmm. listening to a stream and a river And like sitting by a lake and meditating and like just getting grounded and connected with this like bigger thing that is so much bigger than myself. So that is what like heals me today. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, winters are really harsh. It's Mm -hmm. like, let's say in January, it's 26 below zero and dark. It's almost dark all day long. Really important to figure out how to try to battle depression because you can't help but like feel depressed in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. It's dark all the time. It's cold outside. You can't go out and play. Those winters are really harsh. And so I had to learn at a very young age how to entertain myself and also how to use my imagination. So I feel like in those 
months of darkness and cold. I lived kind of in the middle of nowhere with no friends to play with in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to keep myself occupied. So I read a lot of books. I would like check out in the library on Fridays, like all these books I wanted to read. I'd go home, I'd sit by the fireplace and snuggle up on the couch and just read, 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 read. And I think that's the beginning of where my imagination and creativity started. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like, oh my goodness, I want to visit all these different countries I'm reading about. Oh my gosh, anything's possible. Like I can leave this place and explore the world and anything's possible. So I think that like imagination was one of my first obsessions mm -hmm. and creativity was one of my first like passions. And so it was like, how can I get out of here one day? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I do and live the life that I really want to live and fulfill yeah. all of my dreams. And so I think that was an exciting action mentally into like how can I propel myself into forward movement to want to do really well in school mm -hmm. to be a really good student to graduate as soon as possible to want to go to a university and to want to travel and see the world so on one hand that helped me with my educational skills and then the other hand the creativity blossomed and flourished because I was dreaming about all the things that I wanted to do while yeah. I was looking in these magazines and reading these books Even you sharing this, I'm just thinking about the interesting world our kids growing up, like my kids, I'm thinking, right? Where we don't have that aspect of like delayed gratification of just like building towards this thing. I feel like now parents just want to expose and show mm -hmm. as much as possible to the kids, you know, in order to give them that motivation. So I love how because you didn't have all that exposure, It kept like developing that yearning to go out there and, you know, find that big and build that big life for yourself. So I would love to hear how you got into modeling, mm. right? You got into the fashion industry. Yes. At what age? I was about 13 or 14 when I actually started modeling, which is crazy. In Alaska? Yes. It's kind of a back entrance into modeling because at the age of 13, I remember looking in a magazine and seeing the opportunity to enter a pageant. The pageant world is really not the same as modeling world, but I saw it as a way that I could all of a sudden, like, if I applied for this pageant, I could go and express my talents. Mm -hmm. I love to sing and I was a natural performer. So I thought, oh, wow, if I enter this pageant, I can sing, I can use my brain because they have interview competition within the competition of the pageant and I can express myself and maybe there's a way that I could earn a trip to outside of Alaska if All I the win dots the are state of Alaska connect, right? yeah, to a national competition. So at the age of 13, I entered my first pageant. I won and then I got to go to the national competition, which was back east in Washington, D.C. Mm. And then my eyes started to open about like, wow, there's this whole different world out here that I can be exposed to that is starting to motivate me even further to excel in school and to dream bigger. So I made it to that national competition, placed in the top 10. I think I was even in the top five. I got to sing and it just really gave me a, a sense of self-expression. Then fast forward to more competitions that I was involved with over time where then suddenly a modeling agent was in Anchorage. She said, why don't you compete in this modeling competition that is in Arizona? So I got to compete at the age of 15 in the International Modeling and Talent Competition, which was held in Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, Arizona. But when I was at that competition, I got approached by talent scouts who asked me to come to New York City to oh, wow. audition for, uh, I got to go to New York City to audition for a uh, soap opera. I also got scouted by Elite in their petite division, and that's when my modeling career started. And then I also went out to New York and was able to audition for commercials and all and different And that was at 16? Fields. Yeah, I was at 16. How did your parents feel about this? My mom was really excited. I think she was kind of a stage mom and was living vicariously through me mm -hmm. and really wanted me to see the world and experience things that she always wished she could have. Because she was 16 when she got married. Oh, so wow. She was 17 when she had kids. So she was kind of like, go, go, see the world, do these things. 
And I was also lucky enough because education was very important to me that I graduated high school at 16. So I was able to graduate high school a semester early, which was in January and was 16, then go out to New York and experience all these opportunities. So mom was like, yes, let's go. Right. My dad was scared out of his mind and was like, I don't really want this for my daughter. I want you to use your brain. I don't want you to go to New York and experience these. God knows what. God knows what. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I want to have more control over my daughter. And I think you should use your brain because you're super smart and mm. excel in a career other than modeling or entertainment. So I had, you know, dual mixed directives for my parents that mm. made it a little bit anxiety ridden within my heart and soul. I didn't know exactly where I should go, yeah. but I was thrilled that I had this opportunity and I could not do it. I mean, I'm sure coming out of Alaska and dreaming about kind of getting out there and see the world, you right. only think about the excitement and the newness and all the things that are ahead of you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I mean, I can relate. I started modeling at 15 and my first, I traveled abroad for the first time when I was 16. Oh, wow. Yeah. So very similar story. I mean, I asked my mom often, like, how did you let me go? Because thinking about, you know, once you're an adult and you understand all the dangers right. in the world and, you know, you're trying to figure out, okay, I mean, I trust my daughter, but do I trust the environment? I think it was very similar where my mom was like, I just wanted you to be exposed to, right. you know, something bigger and larger and not just see what you see where you grew up. I think that's a very brave thing. I feel for parents to kind of let, you know, their child into the unknown. And speaking of that, something you spoke about very openly mm -hmm. was your sexual assault that you experienced early mm -hmm. on in your career. I would love to dive a little bit deeper into that if you feel comfortable. I think it's important to talk about there's two different experiences that I encountered. The timeline's always difficult to go through, but when I went to New York City mm -hmm. to model and have that experience, I didn't realize the impact of what I was walking into and what kind of Me Too experiences that I would enter into at that age. And my mom certainly didn't know that what that world looked like was was taking place in the way that it was. And so some of the things that I was asked to do when I was in New York City were very uncomfortable. You know, there'd be instances where I would walk into a room and I'd have to go into an audition. And in that audition process, they'd be like, this is what I want you to wear for the audition. Mm -hmm. So I'd leave the room and they'd be like, why are you leaving the room? You just should be able to undress right in here in front of me. Like, why are you so uncomfortable in your skin that you can't undress in front of me right now, right here? You're too shy. Forget it. You're not right for this job. So I encountered those kinds of experiences a lot when I was in New York City. And then I got also encountered experiences where I was told that I like photographed funny and that I should get a nose job and think about other cosmetic surgeries. And like, this is the nose I was born with. And oh like, God. that was like, my <laughs> nose is so little. I was like, I don't even understand. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Make it bigger? Because you can't make it smaller. I won't be able to breathe. And so those were some of the things that were out of line in, in the first stages of New York City. And so... I actually left New York City when I was telling my parents these stories and was like, there's more that happened there. Like there'd be instances where you'd show up on a job and there'd be drugs out on the table and they'd expect you to do the drugs to be able to do the actual scene that they yeah. wanted you to experience in the session. So with that being said, at that age, I was like, I need to get out of here. I want to go focus on my education. Mm -hmm. But I went home to Alaska and when I went back home to Alaska to kind of regroup before I attended university, that's when I was actually sexually assaulted for the first time. In and Alaska? It was in Alaska. Wow. Yes. And that sexual assault was something that I was afraid to tell anyone about. So mm -hmm. I kept that as a secret for like 13 years. But then fast forward to maybe what you might have been talking about when I was actually in my 20s and modeling again in the industry in Los Angeles, that is when I was assaulted on the job. Mm -hmm. And that is what like led me to a place where I hit a rock bottom and I needed to figure out how to get help. And then I went to the rape treatment center in Santa Monica and said, this happened to me when I was 16, this happened to me now and I can't go on living like this, I need help. I gotta get over this and I, I don't know what to do anymore. 
I'm scared. I don't want to be in this industry and yeah. I don't know what to do next. So there's two different stages of what happened to me and mm -hmm. where the healing process had to begin. Wow. Well, that was a flower. <laughs> Hi. Oh, this flower just really landed nice. on my head. <laughs> that was that aha moment when I got hit over the head and that I like, needed to go need and get help. Go. Exactly. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Uh, you know, talking about these incidents, I mean, I've only started thinking about my journey through modeling recently because up until now, I just, you know, put it away. I uh, didn't really try to understand what really happened in certain situations because I don't think it's uncommon for girls in the modeling industry, especially young ones, and especially those that are doing this to build their future and to try to do something meaningful to get themselves out of a small town or make yes. money for the family or anything like that. I think it's so, so common. And I didn't realize how much trauma I'm carrying from mm. those years. So when I, I'm going to start crying. I know, me too. <laughs> there we go. When I was, um, you know, learning more about you and I read about your story, it just kind of like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, I never gave myself the space to think about it and to, and to not blame myself for it. Because yep. I feel like something else that happens is that the way it's done to, you know, women and young girls in this industry or in general, to be honest, it's like you kind of leave that incident and thinking that I do something to yep. provoke this, like that I act a certain way, you know, so you don't really go and ask for help because you're just, okay, I'll learn not to behave this way. I'll learn not to speak this way, or this is just normal because everyone's acting like it's okay it's on normal. sets. You're surrounded by people. I mean, I remember my first photo shoot, I was 15 and the photographer was taking pictures of me and he's like, this is very bland. You need to be sexier. She's going like, to say that. How, I don't know how to be sexier at 15. And there was a full set of people. And he's like, did you have sex yet? And he starts questioning me about these things that at 15, I mean, me still trying to figure out who I am and what I am. The last thing I want to talk about is about sex with strangers. And that was really like the beginning of this constant, you know, incidents that just made me feel smaller and smaller and smaller, but again, never really dived into it. You know, that's kind of what you did at 16, right? You kind of put it away. I put it away. Yeah, yeah and you're just, okay, uh, I'm moving on. What happened at that later on mm. that made you go and seek help? You know, I backtrack for a minute and talk about the like series of events like you just discussed. It's It's very interesting how easy it is. I felt very uncomfortable in those stages of work where I was also put in that same like undress in front of me you're too shy act sexier in front of the camera and I'm like <laughs> I've never even really kissed anybody yet I don't even know how to act sexy I don't understand what that looks like or feels like I don't get that and that was so normal in the industry that you're right like you start to feel like everybody else seems to be able to do this mm -hmm. what's wrong with me that I can't and like you're trying to figure it out, which causes self-esteem issues yeah. that make you feel like something is wrong with you. Yes. And that is the insecurity that these predators prey on. Mm -hmm. So knowing that you have these insecurities and that they put you in those places because they're now superior, you're inferior, there's a power play. They have more power over time to continue that kind of behavior with you and kind of put you in a place of submission where you feel like, Something's wrong with me, and if I don't act on this, I'm not going to work anymore. Yeah. And I see everyone else doing this, and I don't know how to do that, but to i got to figure it. this out. And which, no one is there to protect you, no. you know, because you have these agencies, you have all these people that are supposedly supposed to make sure you're okay. My mom used to call me, I used to talk to her five times a day whenever mm. I was abroad. And I never used to share things with her because I was thinking, like, what is she going to do? I didn't share either because I thought something was wrong with me. Yeah. I was like, it's me. I don't want to share because that makes me look insecure. And I already am insecure, so I don't want everyone to know I'm insecure. Mm -hmm. So I think that when I go back to the question that you posed on me to begin with, it was mm -hmm. like, what was the shift in thinking? And this, you have to think about this. This was years of behavior that I went through with being on the job and being 
in fear that I would lose my job if I didn't act up to their standards, but I never gave in. Like I was not someone who was a- able to give in and have sex to keep a job, mm-hmm. but I was strong enough to be able to like, I guess, allow behavior that was not acceptable and listen to it and just keep showing up. Right. And I don't know how I did that for all those years, but the catalyst that made things change was when I was in a relationship with my now husband Mm -hmm. and we weren't married yet, but his daughter was 16 years old. When I went through that attack in the workplace where then I was told if I told anyone that I would never work again and this person was very powerful and I knew that he was very controlling and very powerful. That was the moment that I had this aha moment of my soon to be stepdaughter is 16. She's also now asking if possibly she could fit model or do some things to make extra money. And would I ever let her go through this experience or be in this environment? And oh my God, I would do everything to protect her so she didn't have to go through what I've gone through. And that was when I was like, I need to change and I need to make a difference and Mm -hmm. I need to go and get help because this is unacceptable Mm -hmm. and I need to value myself enough and give myself that gift to make a change and be like enough I can't live like this anymore and I was hitting my own rock bottom in my own journey Mm -hmm. of self-esteem issues and and that final attack was like I need to go get help and I need to go seek professional help That's the scary thing is when, you know, someone is kind of breaking your personal boundaries, it starts affecting your self-worth. It starts affecting, you start doubting your even Mm decision-making, you know? So it's so difficult to kind of find what are the next steps when you don't trust yourself anymore. So true. So it's beautiful that your stepdaughter kind of zoomed you out of that in order to see, okay, I have to go and attend to this before I can be an example for her. I do. I wanted to protect her. And then I also realized I had to get better Mm -hmm. or I wasn't going to be a good role model or stepmom. Yeah. I was like, if I'm living in this feeling of hatred towards myself because I've been treated this way, how am I going to be a positive impact on her life? So there was two different scenarios that I was looking at at that time, which I'm sure you think about all the time with your own children. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly, I was very terrified of having a girl. So I have three boys. But whenever I thought about, because everyone's asking all the time, are you going to have a daughter? Are you going to have a daughter? Not that you can, obviously. I mean, maybe you can decide nowadays. But (laughs) that, to me, it was triggering me to kind of have those things that I put away come back and I'm I would always think I don't I don't want to have a daughter because I wouldn't know how to Mm -hmm. even help her navigate around because I remember myself just being so so scared and so lonely even though I had support system it's so wild you say that because so many times people have said why didn't you have any children of your own you'd be such a good mom and yes I'm lucky to have a stepson stepdaughter who I've been close to you for 24 years. I was petrified and the choice that I made to not have my own children was precisely that I thought I could mess them up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to mess them up and I don't want to put them in an environment like I had just been through. And I was scared and thought, you know, maybe I'm better off being a stepmom where I don't have the full responsibility. And like, it was scary to me. But even thinking about you as a parent with only boys, Mm -hmm. it's very important that the work I've done with the Rape Foundation is to educate boys and make sure that they know how to treat women and Mm -hmm. that they don't propel this type of environment into the future. So it's amazing with part of the work we've done with the Rape Foundation is there's a men's council and the men's council works with also younger men Mm -hmm. in high school and in colleges and fraternities to help change the culture of what happens in the environment and help change the workplace. So it's still really an integral part of parenting, teaching your son how to behave well and teaching your daughter what to look out for. To look out for, yeah. I mean, I always talk about the fact that when I met my husband, I decided he's going to be my husband because to me, the way he was as a man was exactly, if I thought about my future children, this is how I want my children mm-hmm. to be, you know? So I think that 
if you think about it, so many decisions and so many choices were probably made as a result of all those traumatic experiences. It's so true. I, I remember having a series of unfortunate events of relationships, always seeking a relationship where I felt like, I hope the guy picks me. I hope that all of a sudden I'm worthy. Mm-hmm. And I remember having this conversation with my dad and my dad is like somebody who's very, uh, <laughs> man of few words, but very strong in his beliefs when he says something. So when he says something impactful, you listen. And he was like, Paige, you keep making the wrong choices. You're waiting for someone to choose you. You get to choose. This is your decision of how you're going to spend your life. You get to choose. And then I remember having a girlfriend say, how do you feel when you're around this person? Do you like the way that you feel Mm. about yourself? Do you look at this person and think of them as a role model? Do they treat their children, or can you imagine if you were going to have children, do you imagine that the way they would treat their children would be the way that you would want them to, and do you think that's also the way that they would treat you? Mm -hmm. And there was these very interesting conversations of decision-making that were very different than what I originally thought when I was dating, and I went, wow, wow, wow. It is very amazing when you you meet that person that you're like, wow, the way they treat other people is gentle and kind. Yes. The way they treat their children is amazing. Their children love them and adore them and work and like look up to them. And like that is the center of who they are as a person and that spreads in every part of their life. Mm -hmm. And that decision making at least was shifted having done some work on myself (laughs) to where I was able to make a good choice instead of a bad choice. And I love those questions. I mean, I hope that more women when they make such because choosing your life partner Mm -hmm. is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest choice you'll ever make. You know, it really changes the trajectory of your life. So asking these type of questions in a very honest way, I think will help a lot of women to get out of relationships that do not serve them, that don't choose them. I love those. Thank you for Mm -hmm. sharing that. Thank you. Oh, you know what I wanted to share with you? I read this book. It's called The Unexpected Gift of Trauma. Oh, Yes, it's by Dr. Edith Shiro, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, the title itself kind of explains the the story. Do you feel like your trauma brought gifts into your life? Ah, this is going to make me cry now. I would never wish upon anyone the traumas that I've had to experience, but... It's really difficult to get over sexual assault, especially to be intimate and connected to someone without feeling scared or even in relationships and friendships without being scared and not trusting others. But I feel like the strength that it's given me to overcome those insecurities and those blocks in my life has made me the person that I am today with being able to be a really generous leader to have a safe work environment that empowers others. I feel like I am proud of who I am as a person and the way I treat others. And I feel like I wouldn't have even started my company if Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have gone through some of the struggles that I'd been through. Because when I finally was at a point where I was working on myself and overcoming my trauma, I talked to this life coach who said to me, you need to find your passion and your purpose in life. And what does that look like? And I thought I was going to go back into acting and modeling and singing because I had actually kind of started to get over my trauma and was at a healthy weight because I suffered from anorexia Mm -hmm. as an aftermath of the attacks and the trauma of, of the Me Too experiences. And so I was at a healthy weight. I was in this healthy space. And then I thought, oh, I'll go back into acting because I've got this creative outlet that I want to fulfill. And this life coach said to me, but you don't love the business of the industry. She's like, but you love business. You're a smart girl. You have a great education. You love using your brain and using your creativity. What if you were to be able to start your own company? What would that look like? And what would that passion and purpose look like to you? Mm -hmm. And that was that aha moment that I was like, I get goosies and I cry because that was life changing. I was like, I never thought of that myself, but like, oh my gosh, everything I've been through 
has led me to a point where I think I could be a really great leader. I could have a point of difference in the industry. I could affect change mm -hmm. and, and I could manifest something that could be beautiful. That day that I started the company was July 1st, 2004 with the help of my partners. And I've never looked back. Like I, so I can't say that I regret anything that ever happened right. to me because I wouldn't be where I am today yes. if that hadn't happened. So there is ultimately a gift in that. And the amount of work you've done to get there, mm. right? I think that trauma can happen and people can hold on to it, but coming out of it, right? And that's uh, the steps that needs to be taken. It's a lot of inner work. And it's beautiful that that's how Paige the brand was kind of born and I would love to learn more about the brand because I think that building a company, especially now we're like at a time where everyone is, you know, opening brands and mm -hmm. talking about brands and it's one thing to talk about it. It's a whole other thing to actually <laughs> build, execute and maintain a global brand. So I am so curious to hear about your journey and like the beginning of Paige. <laughs> Thanks. It's so funny. Yes, there's a lot of idea people out there and there's still a lot of idea people that are always telling me what I should do, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is funny. I guess it does take a lot of courage to kind of put that thought into action. What really happened was I was going through this inner work and then I went to that life coach and I came home and I, I, I was with my husband at this time and I said, hey, Elizabeth thinks that I should start my own company and I should find my own passion and purpose and think about a clothing company and what that could look like. And he looked at me and he said, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it the rest of your life. Go upstairs and go to your room and do your homework, you know, kind of joke. <laughs> go and, and start a like, company. Go, start, yeah. <laughs> I literally, I went, I went, I'll never forget it. I went upstairs, kind of buried myself in the bedroom and started kind of building my own like manifestation storyboards of like, okay, what kind of co clothing company would this be? It's like, I guess because I have so much experience in denim and I was known as like the best denim fit model in the industry and I was an expert in helping companies who were challenged with their fit have create a better fitting gene and then propel themselves into success. I started to think about they were all men that all were in the denim industry and there was no female voice in the denim industry that was like really sharing a perspective of what a denim brand could look like from a female fresh perspective. And so that was kind of that aha moment of like, wow, that is really what I want to focus on. Feminine jeans that are sexy and like come from a different point of view. Like if I want to dress up my jeans, what should the inseam be with the high heel? Mm. If I want to wear them casually, running around chasing my little one, what should that kind of feel like and look like if I'm wearing sneakers? And then aside from that, there was really no name of a brand that was identified with a person. And because of who I am, I wanted to have a personal connection to my customer and I wanted mm -hmm. them to know that there was someone that was in their court. So if they were having fashion trauma trying to put on a pair of jeans and find the right jean for them, the I page was going to help them with that issue. So really kind of creating an, an image of a brand through my name and my expertise and experience through the years of modeling and being in the industry mm -hmm. was the focus. And the mantra behind the brand was, I want you to love your body, feel comfortable in your skin and be comfortable in your jeans, G-E-N-E-S, which was really be comfortable with yourself and right. who you are in, in your genes. And that was like the focus. And I was thinking about young girls who had just kind of maybe made enough money that they were like finding themselves and they could go shopping and buy what they wanted to and maybe what kind of handbag they were wearing and what else they were wearing with the jeans and really building the storyboards off of that. So that was the vision and the focus. And I really wanted to grow it into much more than just a denim brand. Mm -hmm. But it started off as just a denim brand for women. Yeah. With the idea and the hope that it would expand into something much more and be Which an iconic brand. <laughs> <laughs> so woo, surreal. I mean, you were so ahead of your time because even tying your name to it. You know, I think a lot of brands, especially back then, you kind of you hid behind the brand and you know you would hire people to try to put the vision together but you had a very clear understanding yeah. of how it needs to communicate how it needs to look how it needs to feel what's amazing is that 
that DNA is still there. I started my own brand and it came from like a place of I loved accessories, sunglasses, jewelry, and it kind of based on, I guess, demand and the audience. Mm. I was like, oh, let's get into clothing. It was a very natural progression. And that's why my question is, you know, building something that stands that has that longevity that has the right company culture you have the right people around you mm. I don't think people understand how complex it is but also True. how in tune you need to be with yourself in order to know which decisions to make and which people to surround yourself with and who to listen to because there's a lot of experts out there you know <laughs> I'm sure you know yes <laughs> there are I think that one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the years is to trust myself. And it's weird because it's like, I am certainly not an expert in everything that I needed to know in starting a business. So of course I aligned myself with other people around that knew more about different things than I did mm -hmm. that could help aid in that process. So I can't begin to say that I can do this all myself because that's not true, but I am an expert in knowing what's authentic to me and what resonates with me. And whenever I went against that grain in decision-making in the company, I failed. Mm. And it's because I truly think that authenticity really matters in longevity when building a brand that people are connected to, which you want them to be connected to. And when you lose that focus or that vision, you can tell in the product and the customer is savvy enough to know. Yeah. So I feel like what I've worked on and what I feel like has been one of the things that has led Paige to be almost 20 years in business and we're getting ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary in wow. 2024 and has led the brand to becoming iconic in which my dream was that that would happen is that there's been one creative director that has had the vision of what the brand expansion and everything should look like and thankfully that is me mm -hmm. and everything is still passed by me and I still have to check in with myself and say, does that feel true to the brand? Does that feel true to my vision? Does that feel true to our customer base and what they like, what they are, are looking for in the loyalty that they have towards the brand? Mm -hmm. And that has actually worked magic for the brand and for myself with trusting myself in making the bigger decisions that I have to make in the brand go forward. And then I have that same kind of trust in my stepson, who is now the creative director in men's. So oh, he has that same vision and that same understanding and that same belief system and has the brands back in those same ways. And so I think that that has been something that has led us to this point. I'm really grateful for, because when I did, even when I'd have like a good example of past it, like failures would be when, and let's say a department store would come and say, Hey Paige, this is like the biggest trend happening in the industry right now. It's a drop crotch, like very Japanese inspired rigid mm -hmm. denim. And like, will you do an exclusive for us in raw denim in this whatever and I'd be like that doesn't sound like the page customer because she's a little bit more feminine sexy with a little mm -hmm. bit of rock and roll but if you're really thinking that the customer is going to want this from us I'll give it a go but it doesn't feel good and I wouldn't wear that and then I'd go and produce it and it would fail it, it would bomb go. I knew I knew better I trusted my if I would have trusted my intuition it would have been like I'm not just looking for extra business from the retailer. Yeah. I need to trust what's going to work for the customer and the brand. So, mm -hmm. um, But you but need those to happen in order to continue reinforcing that, you know, inner truth. You do, as kind you've of, learned, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's those learnings that if you are resilient enough to be able to pick yourself up and mm -hmm. keep moving forward and learning from that, that is, I think, what creates strength in a brand as well. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking a failure and just thinking like, I'm a failure, this is never going to work. I'm yeah. Done. For me, we kind of decided to close the brand because in when I had a moment to really sit with myself and ask the questions like, am I really bringing value? Am I really proud of what it is that we're doing right now? Is this the right time? The answers were no. Mm. And I'm very proud of myself that I didn't keep fighting because I think that sometimes you're just like, no, you know, resilience feels like sometimes a lot of people go and bang their heads against, yes. heads against the wall, you know? So, but for me, because I was very 
brutally honest with myself. I decided that this is not this is not the area where I'm going to make impact. You know, there's a lot mm. of other people like yourself who are moving and building something with intention and my intention is somewhere else. You know, my value will come from somewhere else. So it was a very big thing for me. I loved, I, I called it like my first big failure. You know, mm. I popped the champagne. I did the whole thing. <laughs> oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I hear exactly what you're saying because I feel like I had those failures in other directions I was trying to go with my career. And I know that like I was groomed to be a, an entertainer. My insecurity and experiences in the industry led me to a place where I'm like, I'm not strong enough to keep showing up in this way anymore. Mm. I can't go on another audition and not get chosen or get put on hold and then dropped or get the job, get ready to sign the contract and then they went a different direction. Like I can't stomach that anymore. It's like, I can't do it. Other people can, I can't. And that was that was my biggest failure. Mm -hmm. I thought I let myself down and my family down when I didn't make it as a star. Right. And I wish I would have popped the cork and said, okay, <laughs> I'm done. On to the next one. <laughs> I wallowed in self-pity yeah. and suffered for a long time and got depressed. But Well, I hope you look at it now as being a very powerful move to step away from something that wasn't, that didn't feel right. I do now because I know it would have been detrimental to my health and well-being mm. and you see you chose yourself I chose myself thank <laughs> you and I think that's what you're saying too I chose myself and I feel like the universe guided me in a direction that thankfully mm. was a blessing which is something that I feel that I can use my intellect and my creativity in that I do feel confident in and it is a blessing and I did choose myself my health is more important and family and wellness and all of those things. That's beautiful. When do you or how do you know when it's time to reinvent yourself hmm. as an entrepreneur, but also as a woman? Because I feel like we go through so many seasons. <laughs> That's true. I feel like as a person and as Paige the brand, I feel like we're always reinventing ourselves. And it's kind of what the whole point and purpose was of the nine bars that are on the back of the jeans that mm -hmm. are the page logo. Those nine bars stand for nine lives. And those nine lives mean that it's important to constantly evolve and grow and change. And if you're always wow. doing the same thing that you were yesterday, then you're going to get stuck. And I, as a person, never feel like I've reached the potential of personal growth that I can reach. Like I always search for more. I wanna be a better person. I wanna be a better friend. I wanna be a better mentor. I want to be a better leader. So I'm mm -hmm. always working on myself. And I feel like that's the same approach that I take to the spirit of the brand. Mm -hmm. Like we could be very complacent and think we're number one and all these different retailers I'm done and I'm like but I don't ever feel that I always know that there's competition ready to take my space yeah and I always feel like I want to be better anyway so I think that like the minute we get stagnant and I learned that a lot during COVID that is not a healthy place. Oh my God, that was... <laughs> that is not a good environment for me to live in. I'm like, I need to search for more and and for growth and for an opportunity to be better as a person. So we're going to do the same with the business. Have you heard about the term of included cognition? Yeah, I hadn't until you brought it up and I really want to hear more. Yeah, it's very interesting because I actually learned... I mean, I understood the concept of it and was introduced to the concept of it before, but I never really dived into it. And it basically is the concept of how our clothing psychologically affect the way we perceive ourselves, the world, the way we behave in certain situations, the kind of decisions we make. And I think that's so fascinating and so interesting to think about fashion in that way, right? Like when you wake up in the morning, even from what you pick to wear to meet the parents or go to a job interview yeah. or, you know, color-wise... What was interesting to me, and I don't know if you ever connected it, when Paige started, you started with denim. Mm. So what do you think was that psychological like, connection to you with <laughs> denim? Well, there's so many things that I'm thinking about right now when you mention that. Tell me all yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah, I got to tell you all of them. <laughs> 
<laughs> so first, when you're talking about like the connectivity that you have to close in general, and I was just talking about COVID, I got so sick of myself. At first, I thought it was so freeing to not have to take a shower and wash my hair and like like look perfect every day as far as like, because mm. that's important to me to put my best foot forward in the work environment. So I thought, this is amazing. I could just be grungy and just relax and wear really relaxed clothes and not care. The sweat and Pantera. I got so sick of myself and tired of myself in that way. And when the when the world was kind of saying, this is going to be the new norm. No one's ever going to get dressed up again. They're just going to wear sweatpants every day. You're going to go to work in sweatpants and be real like, I was like, this is so depressing. Because I was mm-hmm. like, I do not feel my best in this environment. Like, I let myself go. And that, like, allowed the depression to sink in even more. So that was one of the first things that I was thinking of. Then I started thinking of how when I was in high school, or even when I was little, I used to make... My, so living in Alaska in the middle of nowhere and not having anything to do in the wintertime, I became obsessed with building Barbie dream houses because my dad was an entrepreneur and he built homes and spec mm-hmm. homes. He always had these like remnants of like cabinets that were like sitting around and carpet and stuff like that. So I'd build my own Barbie dream houses and then I would build and make clothes, not build, but make clothes for Barbie and Ken. And my Ken was named Michael, which is so hilarious that I'm married <laughs> to a Michael. But, like, that's what I would do. And I would start to, like, envision all of that and kind of do all of that this creativity behind clothes. And, like, I was obsessed with fashion. And that, you know, was just something I loved. And then in high school, my friends were named Best Dressed by coming and raiding my closet and going to school in my clothes that were in my closet. And they were named Best Dressed. And then I was named Best Dressed because I always liked to take my parents' clothes. So I'd take mom's and dad's and mine and my sister's and whatever and mix them all up and do mashups and wear something different every day. So then I was like Best Dressed and then teased that I would never wear the same outfit twice and that all my clothes were disposable. So I was very creative in that outlet, but I always felt like a different character every day depending on how I was dressing. Mm. So it was like, today am I preppy? Today am I a posh woman? Today am I a, you know, chilled, relaxed student or whatever? There was always like a different kind of mindset. Today am I dressing up like Duran Duran? Today am I (laughs) Madonna? You know, it was like, I like to role play in all of those philosophies of the clothes that I was wearing. So that was all part of the equation. So then taking that forward into the brand and starting the denim, I mean, the brand off as just being a denim brand. What was important to me in that equation with fashion was that denim never really goes out of style. Mm -hmm. And denim has the opportunity to do everything from being like dressed up to being dressed down. And you can create all these different silhouettes within denim And all these different washes. And you could do everything from cocktail denim to like jumpsuits to wide legs to skinnies. And so there's always movement happening in denim that is like really kind of a foundation of a wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And as we as a culture has evolved into a culture that's a little bit more chillaxed, you don't have to wear a suit to work every day. Like that's happened in men's and women's where it really, you can showcase all of these different shoes and different silhouettes and different personalities and take denim everywhere you want to go. But then I wanted to really complete the wardrobe in her closet and not have it just be denim yeah. and in his closet and not just have that be denim. So the future tripping was what I really want to do is complete that wardrobe. Mm. So create like blouses and wovens and dresses and shoes and handbags and belts and swim and really bring to her and him the rest of the wardrobe that is necessary to be comfortable in from day to night Mm -hmm. and to really create uh, the world of Paige. So that was a long-winded answer, but that's the process of everything. (laughs) What I got from you is that denim represents movement. Yes. It represents variety. Yes. Like you can be kind of anybody, right? You can move around between characters and people and personalities in a way and just never goes out of style. So there's something very 
comforting about that, right? And it's ageless and timeless. Yeah. Yes. And everybody can find their silhouette that they're comfortable in mm -hmm. and then take it from there. So I feel like that's the, the beauty of fashion and the beauty of this denim world that is bigger than that. It's so fun for me to go to work on a daily basis and let's say a new silhouette just came out and everybody's wearing the Harper, which is our wide leg. And look at Love each the Harper. person. Thank you. <laughs> and look at how each person has a different interpretation, a different interpretation right. of it. Yeah. Some have done a DIY, cut it off and worn it with sneakers and some have dressed them up with wedges and a blouse and like just different interpretations. And it's like, that's what fashion should be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I was trying to say. I was like in high school, like I was trying to, you know, find myself w through fashion mm -hmm. in these different characters until I found my own personal style. I think that's the beauty of it in a gift. Yeah, definitely. And being, I mean, you Paige is celebrating 20 years. Yes. It's amazing. It's a huge milestone. Thank you. What keeps you feeling inspired and like creative? Because I feel like when you do something every single day, you kind of get into a place sometimes where you're like, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't look at another pattern. <laughs> do you have that? <laughs> well, I got that way with denim for a bit. Because it's like I was fitting denim for so many years and then mm. started a denim brand. And I was like, oh, my God. I think when it, we were in the age of just skinnies, I was like, I cannot look at <laughs> a way to interpret another skinny. There's nothing else we can do. We've done every skinny imaginable. And then when all of a sudden things opened up into all these other silhouettes taking front and center, it was like, okay, this is exciting again. And, mm -hmm. and really creating also that denim lifestyle, which are the dresses and all those different things. But I think what keeps me inspired in general is I love to travel. And so I love to see what's happening in all different parts of the world. And I love working with young people. So I might start to feel like I'm getting a little stale and stagnant, but then I'm bringing in these young interns who might like show me something a little bit different that mm. makes me look at something through a different lens, which I think is also really, really fun and, and vibrant. So I try not to get old in my thinking and stay fresh and young. And I love music. And so constantly listening to music and artists and watching performers and like taking that and interpreting it into how we dress on a daily basis is something that's also very exciting for me. And then finally, I think my job is never dull. Mm -hmm. So it's like not just sitting, sketching with the design team, coming up with new silhouettes. I get to be in the forefront of everything creative. So mm -hmm. hiring models, picking locations, doing things like this. So um, it's very dynamic for you. Very dynamic. So no day is ever the same. Mm -hmm. um, I also get to sit on the board of the Annenberg School at USC, which is where I went to college and university and work with students there. And so there, there's a day in a life of Paige is different every single day. And for that, I'm grateful. I love that. Yeah. So thinking back about little Paige in Alaska, mm -hmm. do you think she would be proud of who you are today? Ah, <laughs> tears again. I really want to think about my mom right now. Little Paige was always trying to make my mom proud. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted that more than anything. So I lost my mom a year ago and it's been a really hard challenge but I know deep in my heart right now that she's up there as one of my angels shining upon me and she's really proud and knowing that she's really proud of me I think that makes me proud of me because I was always trying to make her proud I think that's the best way to answer that it's beautiful I am proud of who I am and the way I treat people though mm -hmm. I wouldn't have ever imagined this kind of a success I wanted it I don't know that I imagined that it would be this grand I am getting to see the world and experience so many things that I never thought I'd be able to experience coming from a very humble background and living in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And so for that, um, it's surreal. I kind of pinch myself every day going, oh my God, opening a store in London, mom. <laughs> We're going to open a store in London. It's our first international store. Do you talk to her every day? I do. I've got her on right now. I have um, this little necklace that my former assistant, Sienna, and some dear friends gave me. That's a J for Janet, which is my mom's name. 
And then this little ring right here was when my mom wanted a new ring, a new diamond ring, and my dad couldn't afford to get her one. I found this little baby diamond ring and I gave it to my mom as a present. And I was like, here, mom, you got a diamond ring from me. So I wear these often and I do talk to her every day. She's a big part of the motivation and the dreams that kind of gave me this opportunity and within myself and know that I could do something so this big. So it's yeah. so beautiful. Really great. Paige, you've been such an amazing person Thank to talk you. to. I feel like I am leaving here with all these different thoughts and even action plans for myself. It's really beautiful mm -hmm. to see how you live in like alignment and you lead your personal life and your you know your business in such a beautiful harmony it's thank very inspiring you. thank you so much for being with me today thank you thank you i'm proud of you and who you are and i see a lot of amazing things in your future so thank you for giving me this opportunity to get to know you who i respect and admire so much thank you <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't miss my newest episode right here. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway. I love reading your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.